Good morning, good afternoon to our listeners overseas. Welcome to the Health Finance and Governance Project's eighth technical briefing. I'm Megan Moline, I'm the Director of Communications, and today we're going to be hearing about the Joint Learning Network, and we're delighted that two of our partners from Ghana can join us today, Mr. Nat Otu and Dr. Lydia Selby, and Amanda Folsom, the Director of the JLN, um, introduce us to the JLN and get the conversation started, so thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Megan, for the introduction and for hosting this technical briefing on the Joint Learning Network for Universal Health Coverage and the experience of Ghana. So I'd like to first uh, start by um, introducing our guest. Um, today we have a team uh, in Accra, Ghana, who will be joining us, who have dialed in, and we hope the connection will be, um, will be strong throughout this next hour. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce today, um, joining us from Ghana, uh, Mr. Nathaniel Otu, Nat Otu, who is the CEO of the National Health Insurance Authority of Ghana. And uh, Nat is a longstanding member of the Joint Learning Network, the JLN, um, and has formerly served as the convener of the Global JLN Steering Group, which is like the chairperson for the global network. And uh, also with Nat today, we have Dr. Lydia Selby, who serves as the Director of Claims Management for the NHIA of Ghana. Um, and so together, Nat and Lydia will be sharing their experience um, of working in the JLN, and also how the partnership with USAID and the Health Finance and Governance Project has reinforced uh, the learning and their progress toward universal health coverage. And also from Ghana, we have uh, Mr. Chris Lovelace, um, who is part of the Health Finance and Governance Project, the Director of, uh, of Strategy, and um, Chris will be commenting on um, the experience of partnership, both with, through HFG and JLN. So um, I'm going to start today by just providing a brief uh, overview of the Joint Le Learning Network for those who are less familiar with the, the program. And uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Nat and Lydia to share their experience. So that'll be the format for today. Chris will have a few comments um, following Nat and Lydia, and then we really want to open it up for questions and discussions from all of you. And I want to really thank you for taking time out of your busy days to join us. So first of all, I would like to just introduce you to what the JLN is and what its goals are. Um, the JLN is a practitioner-to-practitioner -practitioner learning platform. Uh, it was first launched and rolled out in 2010, so it's about six years old now. Um, and it really grew out of a demand for more opportunity among practitioners to learn from each other. There was a recognition as countries were really on the path to universal health coverage that there, there was a common knowledge of what needed to happen, but how to get there was the challenge. And it was recognized that the literature and the research evidence we had didn't answer all the questions that practitioners were facing. Uh, very difficult questions around information systems, provider payments, how to engage providers, how to engage the private sector, many questions like that that were coming up, these how-to questions, um, yet there were no answers available uh, when, when we looked to the evidence. So it was really um, through the expertise of other practitioners that uh, the network formed, and it, it really is there to facilitate uh, learning and knowledge sharing and co-production of new knowledge among practitioners. So the experts in the network are the practitioners themselves. The goals of the JLN uh, really are about accelerating progress toward universal health coverage, um, moving toward an end goal of extending quality essential health services to the world's population um, and providing financial protection, the broad UHC goals. But to get there, the JLN uh, steering group a few years ago really um, drilled down on four areas that the, the network uh, really seeks to focus on to uh, help countries accelerate their progress. The first goal of the JLN is to um, help countries extend health service coverage to populations, so expanding population coverage with a focus on reaching the informal sector and the poor across the world. The second goal is about extending and increasing access to essential health services. So this is really about improving delivery of health services and, uh, and the essential services with a focus on primary care. And increasingly, we're going to be talking in the JLN more and more about patient-centered integrated care, which is going to be a new technical priority for the future. 
The third um, area of focus in our goals framework is to improve quality of care um, and safety, patient safety. So um, this comes up over and over again when we survey our members and others as a really important area that um, probably has received less focus in the UHC world over the last few years. So um, I think increasingly we're hearing demand for more work on quality. Um, and finally, um, health financing um, as an essential component of the move toward universal health coverage. So a lot of the work of the JLN over the last few years has focused on health financing too as a key component. So the JLN today is now made up of 27 countries from around the world. It started as a group of five back in 2010 and then slowly expanded to nine and stayed at a, a group of nine countries, what we call our full member countries, for several years. And then about a year and a half ago, the, the steering group of the JLN made the decision to expand um, the opportunity for other countries to be part of this network. And so over the past year and a half, um, we've had a number of other countries from around the world join the network. Uh, we had an open call for um, applications to join the JLN. We also have a pipeline of other countries that are interested in joining and are potentially in the process of, of becoming members. Um, but today, as you can see from this map, we have um, an interesting mix of countries, low, middle, and high income countries, um, countries that have practically achieved universal health coverage and others that are very much at the start of that process. Um, so the principle in the JLN is that everyone here has something to learn and something to share. And even those countries that have achieved UHC on paper, like Mexico, are still, are still trying to um, figure out how to sustain services, how to improve quality and other areas of focus um, to, uh, to sustain their universal health coverage uh, program. So the technical framework for the JLN is, um, is really about trying to drill down on some practical, functional areas that support those larger goals I shared. And so you see here what we call our technical priorities matrix or framework, which increasingly I find should probably be a three-dimensional matrix um, because of the, the interconnections between all of these topics. And that's something that's been very important as we move forward is how we can really strengthen the linkages between many of these important functional areas that support the move toward universal health coverage. Um, but we try to make sure that any work under the JLN really is clearly supporting one or more of those four key goals. And many of the activities like information technology and provider payment we know are supporting in very important ways all four goals of the JLN. So today we have a number of uh, technical collaboratives and initiatives that are operating in the JLN. They're uh, formed around longer term technical initiatives which are, are bodies of work in a broad area of focus um, such as primary health care or provider payment, population coverage. And the activities, the action of the network really happen at what we call the collaborative or exchange level, which is when groups of countries come together and work intensively together on more narrowly focused topics that support those broader areas of focus. So we have, for example, in the primary healthcare initiative today, a collaborative that's focused on how to effectively engage private primary healthcare providers. Um, and there's a group of countries in the JLN that have been working together for over a year to come up with a practical toolkit um, to support countries, the purchasers of health care, the government officials, to better engage private primary care providers. So that's an example of how the JLN works. It's through a process of learning and coming together, both in person and virtually over a period of time, and co-creating a practical tool that the countries say they need to respond to some of the, the common challenges they're facing in a given area. So this is an example, this is a, a list of, of a number of the initiatives. We have about six or seven that are currently functional. When we look to the future, we may have in 2017, possibly 10 to 12 um, active collaboratives or exchanges happening around the JLN. So how does the JLN operate in terms of its approach? Um, and this is something that we continue to refine in the JLN, but I think this is this is a little bit of the secret sauce of the JLN. What is um, kind of unique about the approach? And um, it really starts with a common demand identification process where we really try to scan among all of the countries in the network to understand what are the common challenges that, that a group, this group of country, countries are facing. And then through that process, really try to come up with some sort of collective problem statement and agreement on what is needed to um, address or 
the problem or fill the knowledge gap. So the countries really come together, identify the problems that they want to work on together, and then bring their, collect their individual country experiences to the table. And out of that process um, comes sort of new knowledge, essentially, um, or some common um, principles or, or definitions or tools or best practices that countries say, this is what we need um, and we can learn from. And then ultimately, that gets packaged and shared with other countries, so it becomes a global public good. And that process of a collaborative in the JLN can take 18 months to two years to really go through intensively a learning process and come out with a practical tool or product at the end. And I just want to touch on a few of the key benefits or principles of the JLN approach that are really important. And I, I hope our colleagues in Ghana will, will talk more and elaborate on these but I think the country ownership of, um, of the work is, is essential and, and really a part of what the JLN is about. The demand side and the um, focus on the priorities um, of the, the countries is where we start. Um, and then this notion of building a safe space um, for learning where all of the countries uh, feel comfortable sharing both their successes but also where they face challenges. and. Um, really being honest with one another about uh, the challenges they're facing. So creating that safe space for learning is extremely important. And finally, the results in a practical tool or product. We're not just doing workshops one-off, but really trying to build towards something in that process of learning. And I've just included here a few examples of some of the co-produced products of the JLN to give you a sampling. Um, more are coming online soon, but these are the types of products they have different um, formats, um, but they tend to be toolkits um, or manuals or policy briefs, but highly practical and um, really designed to be something that the countries who are part of the process of creating them can, can go home and use, and then they become a product that um, are, is available globally for other countries to also benefit from. So I'm going to um, transition now to our colleagues in Ghana. Um, if you'd like to continue to learn more about the JLN, please uh, feel free to check out the website. It's um, www.jointlearningnetwork.org, um, and you can peruse the site um, to learn more and see some of the products. Um, but now I'd like to really turn it over to our colleagues um, seated in Ghana who can talk more about the experience of working in the JLN and also how partnerships through USAID and Health Finance and Governance Projects has reinforced that. So um, I'd like to invite you Nat, now to, um, to share with us um, what you've really found to be the, the value add um, of the JLN uh, from your experience and what you found to be unique or different about the approach of the JLN. Well, um, as you know, Ghana started its National Health Insurance Scheme in 2003. And when we started in 2003, we had very little support from the global community. So Ghana had to go its own way. It was quite a tenuous process of finding one's feet on all technical issues. And for the first time in 2009, thereabouts, came an invitation to Manisa for the first JLN meeting, which Ghana participated in. Whilst we were there, the topics that concerned us the most were raised. First of all was uh, uh, population coverage, then it came to quality of services, then issues of equity, etc., etc. And we found that first meeting extremely engaging. And, and the one thing that I'll mention is the fact that in the initial days, we wanted a place to go to for some, you know, many kinds of technical knowledge but we couldn't find it. And one of the cases in point was when we started clinical audits and needed to find training programs for our staff and could not locate any anywhere in the world. So we went it our own way, um, tough as it was, with mistakes along the way. And when the JLN back
um, you know, population coverage, as it were. And we found some of these answers in the data. Then we found out that most countries were grappling with the same problems. And so we started working together um, with countries that were in a similar situation as ours, but we also were an inspiration to other countries which had just started. A case in point was when we needed to um, define the specifications for our new biometric membership system. And we completely relied on JLN resources from you know, partner countries in order to be able to define these specifications in a record time of two weeks. Uh, you can imagine getting a consultant to do this. First, it will take probably uh, a month or two to define the specifications, and the assignment itself will take years and months. But then we're able to do it in record time with other countries acting as peers to look at what we've done. The second thing was when we started this process, we relied on a tool that had already been developed in the GLN, which was the open source health data dictionary, which all countries could develop. And so this is an example of how we use the network to improve our match towards universal health coverage. On a third note, as science progressed, what we do find out is that the demand and appetite for other technical uh, specializations are increasing. And today, as we speak, uh, Ghana is a key collaborator in the development of tools for clinical and medical audit within the JLM system. Secondly, what I do find out is that the membership of the JLM is very tightly knit, and we are able to approach each other, sometimes on a personal basis, to know how issues are dealt with in other countries, which is also really good. The third is that we've had a very vibrant online discussion group taking place now on all sorts of topics. It's extremely vibrant, and the posts are very insightful, uh, and these are also of benefit to our membership. Fourthly, there's been actually um, a sort of a galvanizing effort and direction in country where all persons uh, or critical persons involved in, in the UHC movement are getting together, sometimes in groups, sometimes in pairs, but other times, understanding the basic need for us all to look at UHC the way we have defined it in our Ghanaian context and how it relates to other countries. So this is my initial comment on the value of it that the DLN brings. It has improved uh, implementation certainly has contributed to quality data. Thank you very much, Nat. I, um... I've had people who have commented on this. Lydia has been part of this for quite a long time. Great. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I think for us, uh, some of the values of JLN is being able to articulate our challenges. And uh, Ghana has had a couple of times where we uh, approached the JLN with a particular challenge, which has been put out to the wider audience, only to find other people are interested, and a collaborative has grown out of that. So it really is a, a, a unique opportunity to, to find a forum where you can lay your challenge down, and other people get on board, and then together, we solve the challenges and disseminate it out to others. And I think Ghana has been really instrumental in the costing manual, the health data dictionary that Ms. Soju mentioned, and now a very interesting one of clinical audit, which uh, we hope to have soon. And then the data analytics for provider payment, which um, together with HSG, we've now got dashboards up and running that we are actually using for action. So it's all very, very practical uh, for us in Ghana and not theoretical workshops. Thank you, Lydia, very much. Um, now, Lydia, you're serving as the country core group chair in Ghana. Um, would you like to just say, first of all, for our participants, what a country core group is um, and what it, what it really does in Ghana? And then maybe talk a little about uh, what you see as some of the, the major priorities ahead and how you see the JLN supporting you um, to address some of those priorities. 
of, of the collaboration to the extent that for the first time we did a provider mapping in Ghana, and today we are talking about building provider networks and also ensuring early warning systems to ensure that capitation takes place successfully. On top of that, capitation as a payment mechanism is not being looked at the two of us in isolation. We are looking at the entire payment system in order to ensure that the synergies between the systems are maximized uh, so that we have an efficient purchasing system in Ghana. These are some of the examples of the linking it between the HFG and uh, the DL and the Mexico. Thank you very much, Nat. Uh, Lydia, anything further to add? Um, well, not, not really. It's just that um, because the JLN was there and had done indications, then the network HFG came, we could just take that and move on. And then the work we have done with HFG means meant that when the medical audit collaborative started, because we had done triggers and rules on the indicators with HFG. We were already halfway through and we just move on from there. So really each collaborative or work stream builds on what has been done already, making the progress time much shorter. And we're all building on synergies and work that has been done already, which has been very good for us. Great. Thanks, Lydia. Yeah, and I think one of the, the key principles of the JLN has been that um, the demands identified through the network, such as those you've been describing, um, can also be um, useful to partners like USAID and Health Finance and Governance Project and others to follow up, uh, to provide responsive follow-up to the demands that have been identified by multiple countries. Um, so we've heard from partners that that is useful in terms of demand identification too. Um, so thank you very much. I'd like to now turn uh, to, to Chris, um, who's sitting in the room with you, um, uh, representing HFG Project. Um, and Chris, is, Chris, I wonder if you could uh, provide for us uh, your perspective on how you've seen USAID HFG partnership um, with JLN. How have the two worked effectively together um, in the past, and also, what do you see as some of the opportunities ahead in, type, in terms of this, uh, this partnership? Thanks, Amanda. Uh, as you can tell from Amanda's and uh, Mr. O2's and Dr. Selby's presentations, uh, there's a very close synergistic relationship between JLN and HFG, where the countries are both JLN members and uh, country programs within the health finance governance program. The, the key common elements in all of our work, whether it's global, regional, or country level, has really been the, the centering on the country-led development. That's very much embedded in the philosophies of both the JLM and the HFG project. So when uh, Mr. Otu talks about the use of the network to support their, uh, their priorities, and then he refers to the technical assistance uh, and policy advice that HFG uh, has offered to help implement that policy advice that the government has taken. And it's all quite seamless in some ways uh, in terms of which hat, what meeting, who's sharing what with whom. And it works very nicely because of the leadership shown by the NHIA. Uh, but I thought I'd give you some examples of our collaboration because it really goes back to 2013, very, very early days of uh, uh, HFG, uh, and relatively early on for the JLN as well. And we very early on had identified some of the issues uh, uh, that we've just been discussing about. But globally, uh, here's some examples on the slide that's in front of you. Uh, we recently uh, co-financed and supported the JLN Global Meeting in uh, Trujaya, uh, Malaysia, where we supported a number of countries participating, as well as actively facilitated sessions related to country action planning. Video led the Canadian group in terms of developing the action plan for Ghana. Each of the countries developed one, as I say, we helped facilitate it. And we had a session on implementation research that was led by Rita Eichler, um, Brock, uh, one of our HFG partners. Um, another example is uh, HFG and the JLN, uh, 
education office working together under an activity called Learning Exchange on Governance and Quality, uh, which we also partner with the ASSET project, WHO and IHA as well. Uh, there's a number of activities related to this, but uh, recently there was a major workshop uh, in Dar es Salaam where the countries got together and exchanged views on uh, how the intersection of governance and quality uh, meet and the kinds of things that need to be done. And, and again, Donna will be leading the role in that workshop. So, uh, global activity, strong support from the country, jointly uh, shared by JLN and HFG. Other examples, an HFG publication called Using Evidence to Design Health Better Plans. Several of the countries, JLN countries, uh, contributed chapters to that analysis and then put into it. Uh, and a new activity that we have is related to strategic communications and stakeholders engagement with Chief UHC. Uh, and that's a new activity, but uh, in Ghana, we're already well advanced in that, and that Ghana uh, pulled uh, around their benefits package, and more recently around the NHIS review, uh, to organize. Uh, uh, stakeholders' consultations that included uh, support from HFG and JON. Example of how we go from global initiatives down to country level activities. In terms of regional collaboration, uh, we uh, collaborated on a peer to peer learning workshop on financial protection and improving access to healthcare uh, this past February in Accra, where a number of the JLN countries uh, participated. And we have an active discussion going on in the Asia region right now regarding uh, the possibility of collaboration related to public stewardship and the private sector. Uh, and a third activity that's under, you know, actually it's more than under discussion, we're beginning to take additional steps. Uh, we're supporting JLM participation in an Asia Pacific network for health system strengthening course in Indonesia on partnership with the private sector to achieve. UHC. So not only is the network and HFG collaborating together, but we're trying to encourage collaboration between their most networks as well to make sure that the synergy is built upon. And at country level, uh, as, as both Mr. Otu and Dr. Selby pointed out, uh, participation in JLN in some ways has created the demand and the strategic direction that then creates the subsequent demand for technical assistance. Uh, and support in implementing those directions. And, and if this is where uh, local and bilateral projects such as the HFG come into play where we can help drive forward the policy choices that are made under the leadership of uh, the country, in this case, in, in, uh, NHIA. And we have examples of that not only in Ghana, but in Nigeria, Vietnam, and we have active discussions going on in Indonesia to again find this sort of magical partnership where the synergies are revealed on one another. We take advantage of the global knowledge and we apply it to different circumstances, led and driven by the country itself. So if we go to the last slide, uh, this slide, which is called HFG GMN collaboration, just in case that's not what you're looking at, uh, shows how all of this intersection takes place. So the, the yellow and orange boxes are all kind of joint learning inputs that no doubt with JLN exercises. Uh, the brown reflects the Ghana country led development of activities, and the blue boxes present specific activities that HFG then has taken on as activities to support the NHIA in implementing both the management dashboard and the application early warning system that we talked about earlier. These are just an example of using apply this literally across the whole of our program of support here in Ghana and in other countries as well. So maybe we will stop there, uh, Amanda, and uh, of course we'd be happy to join in the discussion. Terrific. Thank you so much, Chris. So um, I'd like to just um, wrap up with a couple of, of comments um, on where the Dale is going in the future um, to, to just leave a little of that with you. And then I want to turn it over to you, um, the, the participants, for discussion and questions. We've been uh, receiving a few questions uh, via WebEx, so please continue to send those via chat. 
um, and we're curating those and we'll select a few to, to discuss together. Um, just in terms of the JLN and future strategic priorities, I wanted to just highlight maybe today two areas that I think are very important. And Nat and Lydia, please feel free to comment on these um, as you see it from your, from your vantage point. Um, these are two areas that the JLN steering group, um, which really is the governance um, structure for the overall JLN, have really been focused on lately um, and I think will continue to be important areas for the future. One is on building out, um, deepening, and, and increasing in number um, the, the technical collaboratives or exchanges um, throughout the network. As membership has expanded in the past year, the demands have grown on the network in terms of the topics that countries want to focus on. So um, we're going through this expansion phase and uh, really wanting to make sure that there's a robust set of offerings to respond to, to the increased demand. And the demand is diverse because we have such a diversity of countries. And so what's happening is we're breaking down into sub-communities within the JLN to focus on specific issues. So this is, um, I think this partnership that we've been discussing today is an example of how we've been able to um, create some new offerings and some new that are come, new offerings that are emerging uh, in the future. And so that's really how the JLN operates is through creation of partnerships to address those priority challenges. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we really want to focus on some of those interesting cross-technical intersections like where provider payment and IT come together or how provider payment can support primary health care. So really trying to not um, think in siloed ways, but really try to take an integrated approach in how we think technically. And secondly, uh, focused on the, the country infrastructure for the JLN in terms of strengthening um, the, the networks that Lydia has talked about at the country level. Um, so this is a really important area, and this is where the learning at the global level can really be translated and adapted at the country level. So a lot of focus on strengthening um, and building country core groups or networks for learning at the country level. Um, so that's, uh, that last point, I think, really takes us to one of the questions that maybe we'll start with um, that has come in in the course of um, our discussions. This question, um, I'm going to bundle two questions. Uh, can you give a sense of JLN shape and size in a typical JLN country? And is there a country present? Um, so I'll briefly respond, and then Lydia and Nat, you might want to say a, say a little about this um, in terms of, of what it looks like in Ghana, um, which you described briefly, Lydia, already in terms of the country core group. The, the country presence of the JLN is the practitioner, it's its government actors, largely, um, who are the individuals um, representing key UHC agencies in their countries. Those are the members of the JLN. Um, so the, the network or the presence or the practitioners. Um, the country core group is the structure, and again, that's made up of practitioners, but also uh, partners uh, can participate in, in country core groups, and, and I think that's the makeup of those country core groups can vary from country to country based on who's really um, a key stakeholder in the UHC domain. Um, we have in um, some of the countries established a role called a learning coordinator, which is somebody who really supports the country core group um, in communication and convening in tracking activities. Um, and that might be a part-time person that the government identifies or a partner supports. So those are examples of, of presence and, and what a country presence looks like. Matt and Lydia, would you like to, to um, elaborate on that, that question? Well, my experience has been that for the country core group to be successful, you need a strong organization around which it evolves or revolves. So in Ghana, it has been the National Health Insurance Authority, but it's also a very delicate process because you must be careful not to um, make other you know, participants feel, uh, you know, handy and not, not having an opportunity to operate freely. So we have that sort of loose arrangement, but at the same time, revolving around the key institution. We found this is very successful. The second thing is that the country core group itself um, determines its own agenda. And, you know, at the various meetings that we've had, we determine our own priorities. And some of these priorities have ended up feeding into the global network in regards to what are priorities and where are the areas of sharing of learning. And this is what I just want to add to. Um, 
what we have done at the moment is um, we have the steering group representative. The chair is myself, but the vice chair comes from the uh, service provider, uh, somebody senior in that area who can represent their interests. And then for each of the main identified areas of the GLM, like primary health care, provider payments, quality or whatever, we pick three key people from different institutions who are supposed to lead activities in that area to make sure that all the agencies and stakeholders are fairly represented. But when collaboratives or workshops come, we identify people within the different stakeholders who are key for that particular activity and make sure they are the ones who decide the song. Thanks, Lydia. Uh, a second question that came in was, does the JLN always coexist with HFG? Um, Chris or Nat, would you like to respond to that? Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Sure. The question is, does the JLN always coexist with Health Finance and Governance Project, HFG? Does, do we have a setup like what you've described in every country of the JLN? No, we don't. First. HFG operates in some 30 countries, a handful of which are JLN countries or active JLN countries. But in those countries where both exist, where the country both belongs to JLN and HFG has a presence, uh, I think we consistently try to find whether there's a pathway or whether it's an opportunity to collaborate. But it's really driven by the country's views itself. For example, here in Ghana, Mr. Otu insisted that we work together. Uh, and that you know, created the environment that encouraged the sort of sharing and interest. We're developing those relationships in Nigeria. Uh, we hope to develop them in India. We're discussing them in, in Indonesia. They've begun in Vietnam. So yes, where we, where we overlap in the countries, we look for those opportunities. Ghana, I think, is a particularly good example of how, how well they can work. Well, I, I just want to add something to it. I, I think it's not so much the collaboration or coexistence within HFG and the GNN that is important, but it's the fact that countries co develop knowledge and it becomes the basis on which other development is constructed. I think that's the most interesting thing. So it could be the JNN and HFG today, it could be the JNN and some other similar organizations in the future. Yeah, really good point. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm going to turn to our audience um, that's here in person in Bethesda um, to see if there are some questions from the room um, that you'd like to discuss. Great. Maybe a very basic question, but if JLN provides this space for partners' engagement, you know, sh uh, shared knowledge, et cetera, what provides the backbone of the uh, JLN? You still need to have a basic human and technological and financial infrastructure. So can you say a little bit more about how that's put together? Sure. So um, the question, I'm just going to repeat in case um, our listeners uh, weren't able to pick that up. What is the, the backbone or the what are the sort of the operations, I think, behind the JLN that um, the human resource core, you said, um, that really support the activities? Um, so I'll, I'll mention a couple of things there, and I think we have, we have some JLN facilitators in the room also in Ghana with, uh, with our colleagues seated there. But the JLN activities really rely on strong facilitation, and that's, that's the, the people component in terms of organizing the collaborative and uh, bringing the groups together and helping to facilitate that process towards co-production of a product. And so that's technical facilitation. Um, and I, we have um, Cheryl Cashin and my colleague uh, Nathan Blanchett, who are in the room in Ghana, actually, who might want to comment a little more on that particular feature. But um, in